Hi, and welcome to this edition of the Bobcat Buzz Podcast, where we talk about the buzz at Frontier Community College. I'm Derek Dunn, your host. Thank you for listening and watching the podcast on the Frontier Community College Facebook page and YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, uh, like the Frontier Community College uh, Facebook page, subscribe uh, to the Frontier Community College YouTube channel as well. Well, normally for the podcast, I have a guest sitting next to me. However, for this podcast, well, my guest has joined me online at a land, land far away. Well, we'll say about a little over an hour away. But uh, my guest for the April edition of the Bobcat Buzz podcast is Wayne Hart. He is the chief meteorologist at WEHT, WTVW in Henderson, Kentucky. I've known Wayne for the past several years. I've sent local weather reports to him and other meteorologists in the region, along with the National Weather Service in Paducah, Kentucky, and you could also say I probably copied my I probably copied his style a little bit when it comes to uh, you know live streaming um, severe weather action in terms of severe weather coverage when I was in radio and also on my YouTube channel. So uh, Wayne, thanks for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with me about weather and other things, man. You're good to be here uh, again, Derek. Uh, it's it's been a uh, a good week for me. I've been doing a lot of traveling. I was down in Paducah at the National Weather Service uh, Spring Severe Storm Workshop uh, this morning, so this timed out really well. Normally, I'd be on TV right now, but I get to be with you instead. <laughs> I tell you what, man, it's it's a real treat. It's a real treat. Um, but Wayne, um, obviously, there's a big day coming up for the region and parts of the country. The total solar eclipse going to be happening on the afternoon of April 8th. And so, uh, you know, how excited are you about this event and talk about the preparation for it as well, because I know this is different than severe weather coverage and all that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's for, for most people, a once in a lifetime event. Now I'm trying to remember in 2017, did you have totality up in Wayne County? We Um, did a little bit, but I think we were just maybe outside the middle of it, but, uh, Mm -hmm. but you kind of make it, I remember seeing it though a little bit. Okay, so this one will be a, a total eclipse, uh, and those don't happen very often, and it's going to be a long time before it happens again in this part of the country. Uh, next one that will be anywhere in the region, I think, is 2045, and you have to go down to Little Rock, Arkansas to see that one. So something hopefully everyone is going to take advantage of and get out and see. I mean, some of the younger folks may not realize just how significant this is and how special it is. But from my standpoint, it's a unique situation because uh, we did go through this in 2017 when we had totality with the eclipse in western Kentucky. And that was during August. And everything looked out, worked out well with the weather with that. But this one's in April, obviously, cloudier time of the year. And so the challenge really leading up to it is going to be trying to get a forecast, uh, obviously, that is as accurate as possible, but to try to give folks an idea what the chances will be. Uh, Unfortunately, it probably won't be a slam dunk either way. It's a little less than 50% odds that we're going to have good conditions skywise to see it, just based on climatology. And, And this time of the year, systems move quickly, but I'm hoping that at least a few days out, we'll have a decent handle on, on how things are going to set up. And well, we will at least have a handle, but specifically how things will be at two in the afternoon on that Monday, uh, that's going to be the challenge leading up to this. And right now we are, let's see, 12 days out looking at the latest guidance. Uh, our main American model is looking pretty cloudy for that day, but the European model, which is also a very good model, is holding off the clouds a little bit later. But at this at this time range, you can't put too much stock in specifics, especially down to the hour. We're going to look for trends. So the trend we're seeing is that we'll be in an active pattern. It looks like some sort of major storm system will be moving across the country, impacting our region early in that week. And we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed that it'll spare us uh, for that uh, time, uh, that 2 p.m. time frame on that Monday afternoon. Well, I know that you... Uh... You shared a post with the National Weather Service in Louisville, Kentucky, and you kind of wrote off of my next question here, but it's been kind of hit or miss over the past few years regarding April 8th. And so I think it's more of a coin flip on that day so far. What do you think? It really is. When you look at climatology, it's about a 50-50 chance. Uh, You look at the past few years and they've been cloudier than they have been sunny. 
Uh, but, you know, we can have clear days like this afternoon. We cleared off. We got blue skies, not a cloud out there. So that would be ideal conditions. But, uh, you know, yesterday we had clouds. So it's that time of the year. You're going to go back and forth from some really dreary and active gray weather to sunny weather. And again, at this one and a half week time frame, it's, it's still too early to nail it down. But I think as we get a few days out, we'll have a decent handle and that will give people the option to travel if they want to. They have that luxury because this is going to be impacting a lot of populated areas through the country. And here in southwestern Indiana, southern Illinois, uh, you could hop on I-69 and head northeast up across Indiana and kind of follow the path of the uh, of the total eclipse. So if the weather is a little better northeast, it'll be a little bit easier to get to. But if you have a day or two's notice, you can make that plan. And if you have that luxury to maybe travel somewhere to see this, since it may be your only chance to ever see a total eclipse, hopefully we'll have at least that kind of information to give you a couple of days out. And the one thing too is, well, a couple of things really. One is, you know, for tourism, you know, this area, this region, it's been talked about the tourism. There's going to be an influx of motorists, of people here. A lot of communities in the area and region that have already got these events planned and scheduled. So you're also hoping for good weather for them as well. That's true. And it's uh, I know a lot of folks are doing weekend events leading up to the, the big day on Monday. So we, we really want a nice three day weekend there with, with Monday on the back end. And so, yeah, a lot of. Uh, tourists coming in, which means a lot of money for our communities. So we just got to hope that the weather uh, cooperates. And, and there's still, I think, some uncertainty in terms of how many people we're going to see. I know down here in the Evansville area, our hotels are not booked as much as we thought at this point. I think a lot of people may be waiting on the weather forecast to see, do I book in Evansville or do I go up to Indy, Cleveland, Buffalo, or point southwest uh, based on the forecast. And, there, and in this particular eclipse, there's so many populated areas that, that, that will see this, that, that you have more opportunities to, uh, to pick your location. So we're kind of guessing there'll be thousands of people coming through, but we just don't know. But uh, in terms of congestion, it's generally a trickle in and then you get slammed on the, uh, one, once the eclipse is over, everybody wants to leave. So hopefully that weekend into Monday, people will kind of trickle into the area. But once the eclipse is over that Monday afternoon, that's when traffic will, will likely get pretty bad across the area. It'd be like rush hour traffic all over. Um, but does a total solar eclipse impact weather patterns in the surrounding areas? It doesn't really impact patterns. Now, there's subtle changes we'll see uh, during the total eclipse. As you might guess, the temperature will drop some. Uh, it could be a dramatic drop if we're coming from a sunny sky, a beautifully sunny in a warm pattern, uh, as opposed to a chillier uh, day. So you will see the temperature drop. Uh, and generally, you see less cloud cover because clouds normally develop because of rising air and air rises because the sun heats the ground. So you lose some of that heating and you might see a decrease in the cloud cover. But the totality only will be lasting about three to four minutes up in your area. So it would be a pretty subtle uh, impact on the weather. Pretty much uh, whatever we got to going into it is what we're going to have to deal with. And in terms of uh, anything that the eclipse itself is going to impact, I don't think we'll have any uh, dramatic impacts or significant impacts on whether we can see the eclipse or not. Yeah. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. And um, I had a student in my office one time, he was taking a college tour of our campus and uh, he wanted to become a broadcast meteorologist like you. And I actually mentioned your name. And so talk about the educational side of things, but April is community college month and I'm employed here at Frontier Community College in Fairfield. So I was wanting to know a couple of things. One is what does community colleges mean in your eyes? And two, you know, what are the essential courses that college students should take to pursue a career in meteorology? Well, let me start with your second question. Uh, if you want to pursue a bachelor's degree in meteorology, you're going to have to at least be good at math. You don't necessarily have to enjoy it. I didn't. But the math portion of the degree is what holds a lot of people back. They just can't handle the math. So if, if that's the degree you want, we're talking a bachelor's of science degree in meteorology, not necessarily broadcast meteorology, just meteorology itself. Take as much math and science as you can in high school, because uh, the science is really based on the law of physics, 
And all that's based on mathematical equations. So get as much of that in as possible. And then also computers, uh, obviously a big part of what we do in, in so many professions today, but very much so in, 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 in meteorology. So the more proficient you are with computers and all aspects that will also give you a leg up. And so when it comes time to getting your education, you know, my thoughts have kind of changed on community college. You know, I, I got a degree from Cornell University, four years there, but my kids recently went to college. Uh, they're in their mid-20s now, and uh, my, my son graduated from Murray State down in Kentucky, and, and I'm learning a lot now about really how valuable community colleges are because uh, the price of education, as we know, is high. We know a student loan debt is high, uh, and, and that is hampering so many adults once they graduate. They get their profession, their careers going, and they have so much student loan debt. And when you go all in on a four-year school, and it might be a pricey school, a lot of people, they'll just you know, sign the papers and worry about the debt later. But the community college gives you an ideal opportunity to go for two years, perhaps close to home, uh, where you can stay close to your family and friends and get the basic requirements that you'll need for your degree. And then after two years, you can transfer to whatever school that you want, and you still get your degree from whatever that school is that uh, you, you've been dreaming of or striving for, but you saved a lot of tuition. And, and I think the community college uh, is a big, big plus when it comes to that. And if it's close enough to your home, you can even still live at home for a couple of years and save a lot of money. I think the less money you spend on, on your college education, the better off you're going to be. Because in this day and age, it's not so much where you go to college. Uh, there's a few professions where your, you know, your college might open some doors. But really, it comes down to your ability and what you're able to do. And in a lot of professions, we don't even look at what college it was. We just want you to have a degree in, in X, Y, or Z. If you got that degree and you're good at what you do, that's what's important. And that's where the community college can play a big role in getting those basic requirements uh, in an inexpensive way, first two years of your education. Well, I went to Wabash Valley College. I went to Frontier Community College first, and I transferred to Wabash Valley College. And Kyle Peach, you and I know Kyle. He was the I was one of his students back then, and it helped save money for me that eventually I transferred to Eastern Illinois University. But uh, um, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm so glad I went to a community college. And um, you know, one of the things I noticed was I uh, just a question, but what are some electives that maybe could enhance, you know, maybe a student who's pursuing meteorology. Do you have any, I thought it's something like maybe public speaking, for example. Well, yeah, no, I talked about meteorology. Now, if, you're, if you want to do broadcasting, then you have to, you're going to have to be comfortable in front of a camera. And for me in, in high school, I didn't necessarily want to be on TV. I just kind of wanted to be a weather forecaster, but I was in theater. So I did a lot of theater. I had all the leads in the play and, and that, gave me an opportunity to be comfortable in front of people at least. I did that for four years. And then when I got to Cornell, tried to do acting and weather and I couldn't do both. There's just didn't have enough time. So I put acting aside, focused on meteorology, but also became a, a radio disc jockey for three and a half years. Uh, and that gave me more experience in front of a microphone. And then finally I had a chance to do uh, weather on a cable TV station in Ithaca, New York. And that gave me two years of experience in front of the camera. But up until that point, I wasn't necessarily wanting to be on TV. But what I tell people that are interested in broadcasting, and you have so many more opportunities today than I did growing up, certainly you got YouTube and you can set up your own studio at home. The more you get comfortable in front of the camera, the better off you will be. Because uh, especially when it comes to TV, whether your degree is okay, we just make sure you have a degree it really comes down to how well you communicate to your audience in front of the camera. And that comes with practice, experience. Um, and, and to a degree, I think you have to be kind of born with it. I, I've, I've run into some people over the years. They really want to do it. They practice and practice and practice, but they just don't have whatever gene it is that enables them to really relate to the camera. I feel bad for those people, but that's a small minority. A lot of people, and myself included, when I first started, not very good, 
but I was able with practice and, and repetition to get better and better and better. So practice, broadcasting, public speaking, I took that in college. Anything that gets you in front of people and or a camera that you are speaking uh, off the top of your head, especially, uh, and that's you do that in public speaking as opposed to a play where you're memorizing a script. You want to be able to think on your feet and talk. So, so that is is really important, I think, if you want to get into some sort of broadcast meteorology. Okay, Wayne, well, I got a few more minutes here. I just got the notification uh, here, but um, let's talk about severe weather. I know that um, severe weather could happen any time of the year, but April and May is when it really gets going. And we saw recently the EF one tornado that touched down northeast of Fairfield, and so I was wanting to know because of the mild winter that we had, do you foresee us having an active severe weather pattern or maybe, maybe it's a little less than it was in previous years, because I know that there's a talk about the El Nino that's been going around. Yeah. Well, the El Nino is now fading. So yeah. we're going to go into what's called a neutral phase, not El Nino or La Nina over the summer. And then La Nina kicks in in the fall. Yeah. So La Nina springs are, are stormy ones for us, but since we're trending towards that, uh, the longest range data for the next three months is kind of indicating wetter and warmer than normal conditions, which would tend to increase our threat for some severe weather. So I'm not going to say it's going to be a terrible severe weather season, but I think we'll see certainly more action than we saw over the winter, which is fairly quiet. Of course, up in Fairfield, you had the one bad storm in the in the front part of our season or end of the, the winter season, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now I think as we go through spring, especially as you mentioned, April and May are kind of the peak for that. And I think uh, we, we might average a little bit more than normal uh, when it comes to severe weather this season, simply because of the way the patterns will be shifting. But uh, nothing that's too out of the ordinary for us. We've had some stormy springs in the past and, you know, this might, might kind of be edging that direction. Right. Uh, Wayne, another th important thing too is I think with the EF one that just happened, I think it's a sign to where if you have a severe weather preparedness plan, always good to have one, your tornado safe spot. If you don't have one, now's the time I feel like. Right. You have to have, uh, first of all, multiple ways to get a warning. Now everybody, who's young has a phone. And so they, they, they rely on their phone for everything. And yes, you will get alerts on your phone, but if the cell tower goes out hit by lightning or a storm wind, then your cell phone is no good to you. So we always say a weather radio is like a smoke detector in your home that will alert you, especially in an overnight event, you can go to bed and if, if it gets bad, the warning is issued, the siren wakes you up and don't rely on outdoor sirens because they are designed for people outside. So, uh, have a way to get warnings, multiple ways to get warnings. But as you mentioned, have a safety plan. Everyone needs to know where that tornado safe place is in their home. And next week, we're actually having safe place selfie day where around the country where we encourage people to take pictures of them in their safe place. I think it's next Tuesday, but watch social media for that. Uh, and, and every home is different. So I can't you know, talk to you and, and just tell you where in your home to go. Obviously, if you have a basement, that's the best place to be. If you don't have a basement, you put as many walls between you and the wind as possible inside of your house. And then wherever that spot is, you get covered up with a piece of furniture, mattress, at least a blanket. You got a helmet on, helmet, you put a helmet on, you get shoes on your feet, make sure your cell phone is powered up and just have that spot and make sure your kids know where that is too, even the young ones, because they may not, you may not be around, they may be home from school and you're not there yet. And I say you got a minute to get to your safe place in Fairfield and your kids need to know where to go without having to ask you. So that's important. Find that spot and make sure everyone in your family knows where it is. All right, Wayne. Well, I'm going to wrap it up with this here. Um, but uh, <laughs> this question, I had to really um, I had to really think hard about this last one here. But uh, you're a legend in the tri-state area for storm tracking and was wondering, have you ever tried to negotiate with a thunderstorm to keep the lightning to a minimum? <laughs> <laughs> I try to negotiate holding off these storms out of say prime time. So last thing we want to do is in interrupt the bachelor, you know, and thank goodness we didn't this year. Uh, Cause that kind of just ended this week. So yeah. when you have a major television event, you said, please, please, if we're going to have storms, just hold off until they're over with. 
but yeah, we know they're going to happen. And and honestly, the better, the later at night, it is the easier for us because we don't have to worry about programming. But obviously, late night events are more dangerous because people are sleeping. So it doesn't matter whenever the, the day or, or, or the time. Um, if it's a tornado warning, we're going to be in the air tracking it. And as much as I would love to have control over that, uh, I don't. And I and I get mad sometimes. I say, my gosh, it's, it's happening on my day off. I got to go in on a Sunday. And then I say, who am I going to get mad at? I mean, it's my job. And and it, uh, it's just the way it is. So uh, that, that's what I signed up for. And so I'm, I'm happy to, to be there when you need it's like the, it's like the whole meme that I saw uh, where on your while you're working, it's sunny outside and you wish you were outside during the day, like a nice day, like 70, 75 degrees. And then the day you take off, it's raining and storming. And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, come on. But yeah. we wish we, we could plan, if, you know, if we could forecast the weather out accurately for, for a month, you could pick and choose your vacation days. But yeah. we're pretty good out about a week. Yeah. But beyond that, it's just trends at this point. All right. Well, Wayne, I tell you what, um, let's just hope that there's good weather for the total solar eclipse. I would fingers love crossed. to see this thing. Fingers crossed. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, uh, I tell you what, what an event this will be as long as we have, you know, there's not a cloud in the sky. There's no rain. There's no storms. Um, I know a lot of people are looking forward to it. And um, thanks for you and uh, the National Weather Service, what you guys do and relaying important weather information, um, whether it was like the big snow that we had, you know, back in February, about mid-February to the recent, you know, EF1 tornado northeast of Fairfield. I know there's a lot more warmer days ahead and stormy days ahead, but I want to say thank you for keeping us on the alert. Thank you for what you do. And it, it, it's greatly appreciated. Oh, you're welcome, Derek. I mean, this it's it's severe weather is the most important part of what we do, and it, it gives us it's satisfying that we're able to provide that service to the community. So we're more than happy to be there. And always good chatting with you. And we yeah. appreciate all your reports. You sent back some great video of the last storm, so we appreciate you. You're kind of on our front line of defense, if you will. And the storms hit you first before they get the rest of us. So it's always good to know what's going on in Wayne County. Well, absolutely, because we're like the western, one of the, one of the most western, most edges of your coverage area. And so whatever hits us may potentially hit Evansville Henderson if it maintains a strength and intensity. So Heading our way. All right. Well, thanks, Wayne. It's always good to chat with you. I'll be chatting with you again during severe weather season. All right. All right. Good talking with you, Derek. Thanks, Wayne. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.